Hey guys, Nick here. Welcome back. And in this video, we're going to cover in detail Newton's second law and free body diagrams and the associated problems. Now, last video um, was more about the basics of forces, what they are, and common types of forces. In this part, we're going to actually do the full fledged process for solving the often rather difficult at first problems involving Newton's second law. Um, this is going to be about a five to seven step process, which I'll explain. Um, and this process was so difficult for me to learn that it actually inspired us to create the channel and the original name, Process Physics. We'll see if I've changed that by the time you're watching or not. Um, it is a rather long process. You'll get used to it over the course of the next two to three examples, but we'll do plenty and we'll also cover some typical challenging extensions such as um, uh, ramps and uh, like pulleys going over corners such as the Atwood machine. All right, and last thing, I do really encourage you, at least at first, to follow my organizational style for how I write my equations when I erase things and replace things. Um, it's very easy to let these problems become more intimidating than they need to be, and you'll see that the way I write them, it really emphasizes new step versus, oh, in this step, I'm just crossing a number out and substituting in a number, I'll erase it a little bit. Um, so just do your best to more or less follow my organizational style. Your professor may show you their own, and that's all right. Um, but if you do like mine, feel free to stick with it. I do use it in when I actually do problems. Okay, so we're going to do this problem in or this process in the context of an example, like usual. And it's going to be a diagonal pull of size t on a box of mass 10 kilograms. It's going to be on a table. There's going to be friction leading to a friction force. And I'm not going to draw any other um, any other things. And the only information that I tell you is that the acceleration in the horizontal direction is equal to 3 meters per second squared. And the questions will be, actually, I'm going to change it up a little bit. We're going to find the acceleration since that's what you usually do. And I'm going to tell you the tension force. Uh, I'm going to make it a little bigger. Questions will be, question one, what is normal force? And actually, I'm not even going to call it question one and two to better reflect the way it's done on problems. Questions will be, what is Fn and what is the acceleration? Okay, and we're going to need to find both these. Um, technically, you don't need to do them at the same time, but we're going to do it at the same time to illustrate the general process. Okay. Step one is going to be to draw a free body diagram. Sometimes you can do it on the picture. Sometimes you want to draw it separately. Now, a point that I want to make here in a star is that this step can be really difficult. this is actually where most of the difficulty problem to problem comes from. When a free body diagram is considerably difficult to draw, um, that is often where people can get stuck. So as a result, there's a trick to know exactly what forces to include on your object. Okay, so we'll draw our mass here. Obviously, there's a tension force, and at this point, you know, we sort of know this is a relatively simple example. We sort of know what other forces are going on, but we're going to use this trick. And the trick is you close your eyes and you pretend you're the object. Okay. 
Now again, it might seem stupid to do for this example, but I promise you it will become absolutely crucial that you do this step. Okay? So you're going to pretend you're the object and you're going to ask yourself, what do I feel pushing, tugging on, or rubbing me? And it has to be directly. It actually has to touch you. So it actually has to touch your skin slash clothes. It can't be something far away that, you know, through a chain of ropes and stuff touches you. It's only the things right next to you. Okay? And then you draw those forces. And then wait. Okay? Obviously, you don't physically feel the weight force touching you, but it's always pulling on you. So in this case, we're going to pretend we're the object here. We close our eyes. All right, we ask, what is immediately touching me? Only things that are literally making contact with me get a force arrow drawn. So obviously, the rope is pulling on you. Okay, what else do I feel immediately touching me if my eyes are closed? Okay, I feel the ground touching me. I feel it supporting my butt upwards with a normal force. I also feel the ground like rubbing my clothes as I am pulled over to the right. I feel my clothes get dragged back with the ground to the left. Remember in the last video I said for friction, you ask what direction do your clothes get ruffled as you are dragged along the surface. In this case, if you're sitting here, your clothes kind of get pulled off that way. And again, if you want, you can do this by sitting on your chair, trying to move yourself to the right without getting out of your chair. Your pants will get dragged to the left. They'll ruffle off to the side of your legs to the left. Okay? So we know that the friction force goes out to the right or to the left. Okay, is there anything else physically touching us besides the ground and the rope? No, so we stop there. And that's the usefulness of this method, actually. Not drawing too many forces. Really, 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 really easy to draw too many forces and get the problem wrong. Okay, perfect. So we've drawn all those forces, and now we add our weight force. Okay, this is our free body diagram. And once you have this, you have most of the difficulty of the problem done. Okay, step two, oops. Step two is going to be to use trig to decompose any diagonal forces. Or actually, I'm going to rewrite this as use trig to break diagonal forces into they're left right so they're horizontal and up down parts so here we have this diagonal force t we are told that it's of size 30 um so we can actually substitute that in if we want here And we want to find, instead of having this diagonal arrow, it's really good to separate it, and you'll see why in a second, into this horizontal and vertical piece. So, using trig, by the way, if you haven't seen or you want a refresher on how to do this, I put out a whole trig video where I do this example a bunch of different ways. So we have, sorry, I said this was 70 newtons, my bad. Okay, and all our task is for part two is find how long this leg is and how long this leg is. Okay, again, I did go over this in the trig video, so I'll go rather fast here. Um, we're looking for the side opposite the 30, and we know that sine of 30 will tell us how big the side opposite the 30 angle is relative to how big the hypotenuse is. Uh, if you plug this in your calculator, it's one half. Uh, 
uh, multiply both sides by 70 and you get that the opposite side is of length 35 newtons and similarly to find this horizontal side you know that if you punch in cosine of 30 on your calculator which by the way happens to equal 0.866 it'll spit out how big the leg next to the angle is, which we're trying to find, over the hypotenuse. Again, you have this simplified equation here. Multiply both sides by 70. Let's see, 70 times 0.866. is 60.6. Okay, perfect. Step two is done. So now if you want, you can replace these on your free body diagram. Or you don't have to replace them, but uh, you can draw them in on your free body diagram. Okay, and now this is the money step right here. The main event. You're going to take your free body diagram, which I'm going to redraw here for convenience. Now, by the way, I'm, at this point, I'm going to write in that the weight force is equal to mass times 9.8, which it always is. Now, if I want, I could plug in 10, but I, I won't for now. It's okay. And I know that the friction force, assuming it's working as hard as it can, which it probably will be, we'll know if it isn't because we'll get a negative acceleration as our answer. We know that when it works as hard as it can, it's equal to the mu of the surface, which I think I told you was 0.3 times Fn. Okay? The main event is going to be what some people call oops, not doing write out either F equals MA along each direction. Some people also call it apply Oops. Newton's second law. All this means is that, remember from the last video, we would do this thing for left-right forces, where we would take the net force, remember net means it's the post-cancellation So if you had a rightwards force and a leftwards force, you subtract off the leftward forces to get like the, after they're done fighting each other, what's left over force. So this, this was forces pointing right minus forces pointing left. And that told us, again, this was along the left-right direction, which I'll denote as x it told us what the mass times the again little x means left right what the left right acceleration was right all we had to do was take the total net force along the x direction again that just means anything pointing to the right minus anything pointing to the left divide it by mass and boom we were, we calculated how big its acceleration to the left or right was here you're going to do the same deal you're going to write out this expression here which again in words really what this means is forces right minus forces left and I'm actually gonna rewrite this even further as look at your diagram 
which you now only have arrows pointing right, left, or up, down, and it's arrows to the right, minus arrows to the left, right, that is what this left hand side is, and you set, you just write those out, so in this case it would be something like 60.6 .6 minus mu times fn, which you don't yet know, and you set that equal to, you write a big equal sign, mass the object times the left to right acceleration. And this is the key operation right here. You convert your diagram into an equation. And besides the free body diagram step, if people are ever stuck on free body diagram problems, it's because they forget how to go from their picture to their equation. And just remember, all it is, is that this equation says in this thought bubble, sorry, this equation in the box, it says, and now if you look at the thought bubble, take the arrows in the diagram to your right. You got them? Okay, so 60.6, .6, yeah. Then subtract off all the arrows that are pointing to the left. Okay, what arrows are to the left in my diagram? Here it's this thing, mu times fn. I don't really know what those are yet. Or I, I know what mu is, but I don't know what fn is, but fine, I'll, I'll leave it like that. All right, is that all the arrows to the left or to the right? Like, you don't do up and down here. Uh, let's see, I got this one, I got this one. Yes, I'm good. So for my left, or actually, I'll just call this the x direction. That, and I set it equal to the mass of the object, which is 10. I'm going to leave it as m for now, times the acceleration left-right. Done. All right, that, you're halfway there. Next step is going to be you repeat for... Oh, no. All right, I'm going to try and finish off as much as I can. You repeat for the vertical direction, right? Now, some people like to use the shorthand of Fy net equals May. But again, it's more important to understand what this equation is actually telling you, and it's that you take arrows pointing up minus all arrows pointing down in your diagram, and that equals mass times the like the up and down oops. It equals the mass times the up and down acceleration of your object that'll allow you to compute the up and down acceleration of your object. Again, this sort of business right here allows you to convert this picture that you've drawn into equations that you can actually get numbers out of. So in our case, let's see, what arrows are pointing up? Remember that we've broken up this diagonal arrow, it doesn't really exist anymore, we've decomposed it, into this upwards arrow and this horizontal arrow. All right, so what's pointing up? All right, we have this 35 pointing up, I'm going to label this equation with y. 35. We have fn pointing up. Since it's pointing up rather than down, it gets a plus sign. And what arrows are pointing down? mg. And because it's pointing down, the weight force points down, it enters in here with a minus sign. All right, all my forces up and down are accounted for. I just write an equal sign and then m times ay. And together, these two equations form a system of equations. Now, if you need some brushing up on how to exactly solve these, I will go through and solve this one, but I do have a whole other video with some typical applications to physics that you can look at. Okay, perfect. At this point, you've successfully converted your diagram into a set of equations, right? One for each direction. This one dealt with left and right forces. This one dealt with things that pointed up and down. Okay, step four of the process, now all the hard work is actually done. Oops, sorry, step four. Step four is that sometimes, and I want to emphasize, sometimes you can set a variable or more, I'll just call it a variable, to zero, based off of the problem.
And usually, probably 98% of the time, it's one of the accelerations. Okay? For instance, if the problem has a box on a table and the box is not floating away, so it isn't floating off table, that tells you that AY can be set to zero. Again, because if AY wasn't zero, then the box would be the forces would be adding up so that the box is starting to magically float off of the table or phase into the table. Another common scenario is if the problem says the box moves at constant horizontal velocity or speed. Constant velocity means the acceleration in the horizontal direction is zero, right? Acceleration is your velocity is changing over time. That's if you have an acceleration. If a box is moving at constant speed across the table as it slides, in that specific case, the problem has told you that the x acceleration is equal to zero. So in that restricted case, you're able to set ax equal to zero. In our problem here, we aren't told the box is moving at constant speed. Instead, we're asked, what is the x acceleration? So we are able to set a y equal to zero, but we can't set a x equal to zero. And we're going to try and find its value. My pen did end up dying in untimely death, so apologies if there's a cut and things jump on the screen. OK, so we were just at saying that for our specific problem at hand, we could use that a y equaled zero because we were given the information that the box sort of sits on the table in the vertical sense, it doesn't start flying off. However, we couldn't use AX equals to zero because we weren't told outright that our box has separate or has constant velocity along the table. We're actually trying to find what AX is and we'll find that it's not zero. Okay, so we're now able to set those things to zero in our equations. So just rewriting our equations nicely here. 60.6 .6 minus mu fn. ax and then our second equation was 35 plus fn minus mg equals m times y acceleration and we just said that for our specific problem ay equals zero so we're able to cross it out and replace it with zero okay step four is complete we have this sort of cleaned up system of equations. All right, step five, and this, this whole step is a secret step that helps immensely. And if you watch the systems of, equation video, of equations video, you'll know that I stressed this a ton and for good reason. The secret step is to count the number of equations you have And also, identify the number of unknown variables that you have. If they're the same, so for example, if you have two equations and two variables that you are trying to find, um, you're guaranteed home free. So you're guaranteed to be able to find the answer with just these two equations if you plug in some numbers. If not, if this check fails, it's a good thing you did the check because you get stuck, you're mathematically guaranteed to get stuck in an infinite loop, which as you might imagine is quite painful, especially if it happens, let's say on an exam. So if not, you need to get another equation or you've made a mistake, usually by replacing an existing variable. For instance, if instead of writing friction out as mu fn, I had written it 
as this. Well, let's do our count, pretending I didn't recognize that force of friction was a mu times normal force. All right, I have two equations. And how many unknown variables do I have? I don't know AX. Um, I don't know FN. I'm told what the mass is. I'm told what G is. Ooh, but I'm not told what FF is. So I have three unknowns, and this is dangerous. Again, if you try to just finish the problem, you are guaranteed to fail. Guaranteed mathematically to fail. What you need to do is to replace this existing variable, FF, with another expression. And in this case, you know that friction force when it's trying its hardest is this. And now look, we only have two unknowns, right? We have AX and then FN. Yes, it appears twice, but there's actually one, there's only one variable that we don't know, FN. So perfect. We know that we therefore can get the answer. We'll be able to find what both FN is and what acceleration is. So we are guaranteed home free now that we've completed this check. Okay, and the last step is to solve the system of equations. Really, it's by substituting in variables and then doing your standard work. So at this point, we can plug in the given numbers that mu equals 0.3. Technically, you could have done that before, but I like to leave it up until here so the equations don't get too crowded. Um, let's see. So mu is 0.3 and m is 10. lower equation 35 plus Fn minus let's see the mass is 10 G is 9.8 okay perfect now again I do have a whole other video on how you can solve these um, but in this case we got a little lucky we don't have to do any crazy substitution to find this to solve the system this lower equation will instantly tell us fn right because it's one equation with one variable it's a standard algebra one equation let's see so this lower equation is 35 plus fn minus 98 equals zero we move the 98 to the other side and the 38 to the other side And on our calculator, 98 minus 35. So Fn equals 63 Newtons. And we're halfway done, or at least we've achieved one of two the answers. Now all there, there is to do, and again, I do cover this in the Systems of Equations video, if you want to be really consistent at solving these. All we have to do is back substitute, so just plug in that number into the top equation. And look, we have one variable and one equation. So it's a standard algebra one equation. Let's see, this left hand side, if you punch in your calculator. Okay, and then we just divide both sides by 10. So 4.17 meters per second squared. We found both the things that we were asked for using this process. Excellent work, guys. Now, by the way, this is a long process when it's written out like this. You'll see that in future problems, it's actually going to make them light speed. Now, we will be doing rather medium hard examples, but for any problem of this size, I promise you it is by far the fastest way to go through the problem. So let's hit the next example and we'll see just how fast it can allow us to go. All right, so let's get rolling on this example. Um, again, this is one that my, uh, my professor that I TA'd for allowed me to reproduce, so this is something that you could very well see on a test. So step one, as usual, is going to be to draw a nice picture of what's going on to the object in question, which in this case is this towel right here. 
Okay, so we start with the towel. I'm just going to make it a dot here. Um, again, you can make it a box or whatever you want. Step one is going to be to close our eyes and to draw the forces pulling on it. Or to rather draw the things that are immediately touching it and if they're pulling on it or how it's working. Now, this says that it's hung on a wire here, right? This taut wire. But whenever there are wires, it's sort of better to model them as being attached to the object in a lot of cases, at least that helps you visualize it. Um, and in this case, it's going to be what we're going to do. So we're going to visualize it instead as two wires that are attached to the edges of the towel pulling on it. So if you close your eyes in your towel, you ask, what is immediately attached to me tugging me? There's this force. I'll call it T1 here. And it's pulling in this weird orientation like this. Okay. Now you also have the second rope over on the left side pulling up on you in this same weird orientation here. And since the rope is perfectly symmetric and you're hanging it in the middle, we're just going to call both of these guys T. Okay, they're both they're both this going to be the same size force. All right. Is that everything that's directly touching you? Yes. All you have to do now is draw in your weight force, which I'll skip to straight labeling as mg instead of w. OK, perfect. Step one is done. Our free body diagram is done. OK, step two is going to be to break up any diagonal forces. And here we do have diagonal forces. So, let's use some trig. We're told that, let's see, we're told that um, the angle here is five degrees. So, when we aren't told what the tension is, that's what we're trying to find. And we need to write this and this. Or we need to find the size of those legs of the tension force, right? This upwards diagonal pull, it's going to be turned into these two things. So using trig, let's say first we want to find this. So using trig, let's see, we want the side opposite the angle, so we're probably going to use sine. And that will tell us what the side opposite is divided by the hypotenuse, which is of length t. So we mul multiply both sides by t. And we get that this vertical side right here is of length t times the sine of 5 degrees. OK, so in our diagram here, I'm going to write that in. t sine 5 is this vertical leg. Similarly, if I want this adjacent leg right here, By now, you might just be able to guess that it's t cosine of 5. But if you're trying to do it out, we know if we punch cosine of 5 into our calculator, it'll spit out how big this adjacent leg is divided by the hypotenuse of t. So if you multiply both sides by t once again, that tells you that this is t cosine of 5. Okay, And again, just note that since this t arrow is up to the right, yes, we found the sizes of these legs, but this middle arrow points up and this arrow points over to the right. OK, perfect. By the way, we are in the middle of step two, decomposing diagonal stuff. OK, what about this tension over here on the left? Well, it's the same triangle, just reflected, so we can steal our answers here. There's another upwards arrow, t sine 5. And there's a rightwards, hor or sorry, this time a leftwards horizontal pull, t cosine 5. Again, that's just knowing what the sides of this right triangle were, the, sorry, this triangle on the right were, and knowing that this triangle is literally the mirror image of it. OK, perfect. Step two is done. Now, step three, the main event, remember, it's about converting this diagram into a set of equations. And the way you do it is you write out along the x direction first, you do right forces 
minus left forces, so whatever arrows point right or left in your diagram, and you set that equal to m times the x acceleration of the object. So let's do that here. What arrows to the right do we have? We have only this one that we've broken up from t, so t cosine 5. Okay, that's all the rightwards arrows. We subtract off the leftwards arrows. That's this one right here. And there's nothing else pointing to the left. Remember, we've decomposed these diagonal guys. We've traded them in for having these two up and down and left to right forces, so they aren't there anymore. Okay, that's all we got. And that equals m times the x acceleration. Okay, now, usually you'd wait till step four to say that things are zero. Um, and cross things out, but this equation here, obviously a number minus itself is zero. And we also know from the given in the problem that the towel is sitting still, so it has no x acceleration. So this x equation actually doesn't tell us anything, um, which is kind of sad, but it's okay. Let's just uh, punch on with the problem anyways. Let's check out the y direction, which is more interesting. Okay, again, the y direction, to translate this diagram into an equation, you do arrows pointing up minus arrows pointing down equals the mass of the objects of the towel times the y acceleration. All right, so let's do this. What up arrows do we have here? We have t sine five, that's this guy from this half of the rope, and we have another t sine five from the fact that there's a second rope attached to it. Now, obviously, a number plus itself is two times that number. So instead of writing, or actually, I shouldn't say that that's obvious. It's really difficult when there's variables to know. But you see the number plus itself. That's the same thing as two times that number. OK, perfect. That's all of our upwards arrows done. Now we subtract off arrows pointing down. In this case, we only have this weight arrow. Again, the weight force is pointing down always, and it's of size mass times 9.8 and that equals m times y acceleration. Okay, perfect. Step three is done. Step four is to go back up into here and sometimes we can set numbers to zero. Specifically, we usually check if we can set the accelerations to zero. And in this case, the towel is sitting still. That's part of the problem, it's just chilling there. So it has no y acceleration, right? It's not starting to move along the y direction. Perfect, all right. Step five, and by the way, I'll just write these in. Step one was free body diagram, which was done. Step two was decompose the diagonal stuff. That's done. That allowed us to only have left and right arrows and up and down arrows for step three. Step four was we could set a y to zero here. Again, this is problem specific when you're able to or not able to do this. All right, perfect. Step five now is to count equations and unknowns. Now, we have a little weird situation upstairs. Um, this isn't really an equation. Zero equals zero isn't an equation that you can get information out of. It doesn't have anything in it. So it doesn't count as an equation. We have one equation downstairs. All right, let's see. Do we have one unknown? We don't know t, so that's one unknown. We're given the mass of the towel to be three kilograms, perfect. And we're g is just the number 9.8. So perfect, we have one equation, one unknown. We're, we are guaranteed that if we just crunch some numbers, plug them into our calculator, we're done. So now we're actually able to look at our system, which in this case is just one equation. All right, we plug in all the numbers we can get. All right, two times sine of five, what is that? Uh, 0.174 mass is 3 kilograms times 9.8 is 29.4 okay all we got to do is move the 29.4 over now divide both sides by oops 0.174 
and we got our answer that T equals 169 newtons. Awesome. Now, if you look back, you see that really this problem wasn't that long. Most, most of this writing, by the way, is my own. Really, it composed of three macroscopic steps. Drawing the free body diagram, yes, and then decomposing it with trig can be a little tricky. Converting that diagram into a pair of equations using by writing out the F equals MAs, which again, all that means is when someone says write out the F equals MA for the Y direction, it means upwards arrow forces minus downwards arrow forces equals M times AY. And you just write that equation down and you let it be. Now you have a pair of equations, and then you find the variables that you need to using some algebra. All right, great job, guys. Let's attack right into another example. I'm going to have to copy this one over. This is going to be a very similar example with an, a block and some cables, and there won't even be the funny business about um, about like is the cable tied here, or maybe there'll be a little bit, but we'll see. All right, step one: object of interest. We should draw the free body diagram for. By the way, we're asked. Oops, we are asked here. What is the angle theta with the ceiling right here? Okay, so step one is going to be the draw the free body diagram. Now, in this specific case, it kind of, there isn't a point in doing the free body diagram for the mass because it's only being tugged on by this cable and its own weight and it's sitting still. Um, so it makes more sense to do the free body diagram for this sort of ring here or this little ball where, where all the cables are attached together. And no worries, if you do do this, by the way, it's totally expected that you would try and do that free body diagram first before realizing the only thing it tells you is that the tension in this cable is equal to the weight. Um, this is just something to get used to that you'll do the free body diagram for the point of interest, really. So in this case, it's going to be where the three cables come together. So let's do the free body diagram for that little ball where all the cables are meeting. Okay, so you pretend you're the ball and you ask, what is immediately touching me? Okay, I feel this cable right here, I'll call it T1, pulling to the right. I feel another cable, T2, tugging on me at this weird angle. I feel another cable below me T3 tugging downwards. Is that it? Yeah. Now, something that you might accidentally do is also draw the weight force for the block. But remember, that's the point of this. Close your eyes and ask only what is immediately touching you. Okay? So T3, it'll turn out, is the weight of the block just being transmitted through the rope. Like, you'll find that T3 is of is a force of size mg but you don't draw it twice and drawing it twice is where you can get into trouble okay perfect and then we're drawing the free body diagram of this little ball so we don't have to do any weight force because it's the weight force of the little ball okay step two is going to be to decompose this diagonal force into an upwards force followed by a leftwards force. So by now I'm going to speed through this. Let's see, the side opposite here is going to be T2 sine of theta. Again, this comes from writing sine of theta is this unknown side which we're trying to find over the hypotenuse and then multiplying both sides by T2. And this side right here is going to be of size T2 cosine theta. So I'm just going to write that in
on our diagram here. Okay, step two is taken care of now. All right, step three is going to be to translate these into um, like the Newton's law equations. Translate this diagram into a set of equations. So along the x direction, we're going to write out all arrows pointing to the right. So here we only have t1 minus all the arrows pointing to the left. Here we have this t2 cosine theta. Okay, and we set that equal, since those are all the left and right forces, to the mass of the object being influenced times a. Now, sort of something weird with the way this problem is phrased, really a better way to do the problem would have been to have the mass just attached to the two ropes. That way it's really clear what mass you should use. Um, and really this is equivalent. If you think about making this rope really short, really the, the mass is sort of tied up here anyways. It's just attached by a short rope. Um, so it isn't really clear what mass you should use here. Someone might say zero. Uh, that could lead you to trouble. But in any case, we're not really sure what mass to use, but it's times the x acceleration of that point, whatever it is, whatever mass we pretend to use. Let's say there's, let's pretend there's a small ball of some mass here. The acceleration along the x direction in the next step, we're going to set it to zero anyways. So basically this whole side of the equation, we're just going to call it zero, allowing us to ignore this sort of pathological issue here with what mass to use. This does come up occasionally, but just understand that whenever you have problems involving AX and AY equals zero, so objects that are sitting still both vertically and horizontally, um, usually you're going to be able to do this. All right, second part of step three is going to be to do up arrows minus down arrows. So in our diagram, we have the up arrow T2 sine theta. That's the upwards part of this rope's pull. Minus the downwards force, T3. And again, we run into this issue with what mass do we use? It's, it's going to be times A, Y anyway. And we know that the Y acceleration of everything is zero because it's all sitting still. So we're going to just ignore that issue and call it the whole right side zero. OK. Hey, guys, I had to make a cut in the video. Um, I wanted to say why I replaced T3 with M times G. And why I did that was that if you look at the big block being held up by the vertical rope, the things pulling on that block are only its own weight, which is of size MG. And then upwards, opposing that weight, is rope three. So in order for block M to be sitting still, the weight force and T3 have to be the same size force. That way they cancel out to zero and the block is able to sit still. If you want to do this more formally, you can actually draw the free body diagram for block M. There will be one up arrow, T3, and one down arrow, MG and T3 minus Mg will have to equal zero because the block is in accelerating. So either way, the second way is the more formal way, um, you get that T3 is the same size as Mg, and then you make that replacement in your system of equations. Okay guys, I had to make a cut in the video because I think this problem should have been phrased a little bit differently. The updated wording of the goal is going to be to find the theta and also find m. Those are going to be the two unknowns because what has been specified to us are the tensions in the two cables. With that we'll see we're actually able to find what theta is and what the mass of the block is given how hard the ropes are being pulled on. Okay, so we take a look at our set of equations. Now again, sorry if I rewrite them slightly differently. Um, I did have to erase a bunch of stuff. We're going to do step four, which is to count, or sorry, we've already done step four, which is setting the accelerations to zero. Step five is going to be counting unknowns and comparing it to the number of equations. So we have two equations, and let's see what unknowns we have. 
the two tensions of the wires are actually told to us. So those guys are okay. T1 and T2 are known numbers. What we don't know is the angle. Let's see. We don't know the mass of the block. And G is just the number 9.8. So perfect. We are actually home free. We have two equations and two unknowns. So we are guaranteed to be able to find both theta and m. Now all we got to do is do some plugging in and some algebra 1. So in this case we got really lucky. Both the unknowns are separated from each other, right? We have two equations, each of which is just one equation with one unknown. We can just do really simple algebra on each of them. The first equation will tell us theta. You don't need to find m first. And the second equation will instantly tell us m. It doesn't have a theta in it tangled up. So basically, the system is really easy. All we have, the first equation just tells us t1 equals t2 cosine theta. Now our whole goal is to get what theta is. And I suppose I really should have plugged in numbers first. t1, let's see, t1, the horizontal wire is told to us to be of size 38. and T2 was told to us to be 59. And of course, G is 9.8. Okay, so the top equation, if you move the 59 cosine theta over to the other side, okay, we're gonna divide both sides by 59. Let's see, 38 divided by 59 gives us 0.644 equals cosine theta. All we need to do is take arc cosine or inverse cosine of both sides. That'll spit out the angle that solves this. And if you do that, cosine of this is 49.9. Sorry, there shouldn't be another decimal. Degrees. Perfect, that's theta. And similarly, in the bottom equation, oh, actually, sorry, we did have we did have theta tangled up the whole time. So it made sense to do the first equation first, find theta, and then work our way back into the second equation, plugging in that number for theta. So now that we know what theta is, the bottom equation has become 59 times sine of, and again we plug in the value for theta, minus 9.8m equals 0. Okay, uh, let's see, 59 times sine of 49.9, this is 45.1. Okay, uh, we can move 9.8m over to the other side. divide both sides by 9.8 and we get that m equals 4.61 kilograms. Awesome. Now you see how this problem in reality it only consisted of draw a free body diagram, convert to equations, plug in numbers and solve equations. Awesome guys. Alright we're gonna take a look at yet another example. I think I'll do either one or two more after. Okay, this example is pretty common and it's a source of common confusion. It has to do with like how much things weigh in elevators because we sort of from everyday life have a general idea that things weigh less in elevators. Oops, apparently I didn't copy the example. What? Oh, I pasted it, that's why. There we go. Okay. And we're going to show how you can calculate like apparent weights in elevators and things um, systematically. So we have a three kilogram box on a scale in an elevator. So here's the elevator floor. The elevator moves upwards, accelerating at a constant rate from this speed to this speed in four seconds. 
So before we do anything, let's convert this to an acceleration. Because ever or not everyone knows, Newton's laws use accelerations in their relationships. So it's helpful if you're ever given speeds and stuff, just off the bat convert it to what the corresponding acceleration is. So in this case, it's 1.6 meters per second over 4 seconds, so 0.4 meters per second squared is the acceleration upwards of the elevator. Okay, the question is, what does the scale read for the weight of the box? Now, for a scale, you can just say a scale measures normal force. So the problem really is find the normal force between the box and the elevator floor. If a scale were put there, it would tell you how hard the floor was pushing on the box, which is what a parent weight is. So we're just going to find what is normal force. So we'll basically quote unquote cross this out and re-ask the question as what is the normal force between the box and the elevator floor? Okay, and that's going to be our question. Now this will actually be a really simple problem because there's no left to right business. If we draw a free body diagram for the box, what do we feel touching us? We feel the elevator floor beneath us pushing up with normal force, and that's it. So we all we have to do is tack on our weight arrow, right? We don't we resist the temptation to draw extra arrows because we use that system of close your eyes, what do you feel touching you? The floor. Anything else? Nope. Then you're done. So we only have a free body diagram with these two arrows. Awesome. This also means that there's no diagonal decomposition to do. Sweet. Okay, we're all the way down to writing out the corresponding equation from the diagram, which just as a reminder is upwards arrows minus downwards arrows equals the mass of the object, so here it's 3, but I'll just leave it as m, times its acceleration in the y direction. All right, step 4 would be to set some of these things to 0, however the y acceleration is not 0 here, the box is accelerating upwards in the elevator, um, so no step 4 either. All right, step five, let's count unknowns here. We don't know normal force, we're trying to find that. Uh, we're told the mass, we know what G is. We, once again, we know what the mass is, and we're actually told what the vertical acceleration of the box is. It's a rather unusual problem, but that's okay. We're told what AY is. So perfect, we have one equation and one unknown. So given that, we know that it's just gonna be a simple algebra one style, find this variable. So I'm going to substitute in numbers now. The box has mass 3. G is just the number 9.8. And again, we substituted in the calculated value for the y acceleration, which was obtained by just doing the change in velocity over the change in time. And again, you were able to do that because it tells you the acceleration was at a constant rate. OK. I'm just going to move this term over to the other side. Okay, let's see. 3 times 0 0.4 plus 3 times 9.8 equals 30.6. So the apparent weight is 30.6 newtons compared with the actual size of the weight force 3 times 9.8 is only 29.4 newtons. So you see the weight that the scale would have read, which again, a scale measures normal force, not the weight force, which is really, really confusing. Okay, On flat ground with no acceleration, they're the same thing. But scales just measure how hard am I pushing up on this guy above me, slash if, you're, if the scale is built into the floor, it asks, how hard is the floor pushing on this guy above me? But first, before we get to those more difficult examples that you're about to see, I'm going to command you to take a state-mandated break because the next examples are rather intense. 
they're going to involve two generalizations of this procedure. Um, now, I know usually I don't do too many generalizations because I think it clouds the subject in a little too much difficulty. However, the nature of this subject is that these generalizations pop up a lot, um, especially on tests and stuff, so I really want you guys to be prepared for it. So I will break from my normal strategy and cover the rather difficult examples of the Atwood machine and a block on an inclined ramp with friction. So take a break and then we'll tackle the next two examples um, and I will see you there. Alright, one more example before we do the dreaded ramp. Okay, this is an, called an Atwood machine invented by Reverend George Atwood according to this problem. And it's a pretty typical example and it brings up one important generalization oops it looks like I've gone way over here um, it brings up one important generalization um, of our process that we've used so far and it's that there's multiple masses okay so step one we just need to modify it a little bit we're gonna draw a free body diagram for each object so here's for mass one and here's for mass two okay mass one you close your eyes and you ask, what do I feel immediately touching me? You feel this upwards pull of the rope, and that's it. So you just draw your weight force, which is of size M1G, and you're done. Okay, block two, same deal. You close your eyes, what is touching you? You feel a rope squeezing onto your hair or grabbing your hair, and that's it. So it's just that, and then your weight force, which is your mass times g. Okay, perfect. Free body diagrams are done. Now, just a note, since it's one rope here, the tension throughout the rope is constant, so that's why I set these to the same number rather than calling one t1 and another t2. Throughout a rope, the tension is going to be constant. Okay. Step two, uh, well, there's no diagonal forces, so that's done. Step three, um, the only real difference here is instead of writing out a y direction and an x direction, we're just going to write out the up minus down for each of these guys. Okay? Now, however, we're going to do a modification here, so I'm going to put it with a red star. You'll do this a little bit. Um, it's one of the few major modifications that you sometimes need to make. Um, and it's going to have to do with defining what direction you call positive forces. So usually, since we call up positive and down negative, the net force that we identify is upwards forces minus downwards forces. That way, if the upwards forces are bigger, the result of upwards minus downwards is positive. But in this case, as we'll see, we're going to actually want to do something separate. We're going to call, by the way, let's assume M2 is big for now. We're going to call this direction positive for M1's forces and this direction positive for M2's forces. Now you're allowed to do this and I'll show you what happens if you don't. You'll still get the right answer, but it's a little more difficult. Okay we're gonna make this assignment so as usual we're gonna do like forces minus other forces but in this case it's gonna be positive direction forces minus negative direction forces instead of our usual up minus down or right minus left. Okay, so what does that give us? That gives us for M1, remember positive is that way, so positive forces are T minus negative direction forces, M1G, and we set that equal to the mass in consideration, so M1, times its acceleration up or down. And again, this is the acceleration for block one. So I'm going to indicate with a little one. Okay, 
for object 2, we're going to do things that are positive for it, which is anything pointing down. So here, the positive force is m2g minus any negative direction force, so anything pointing upwards against the positives. So here the upwards force is T, and this equals M2 times its acceleration. Okay. Step four is going to be usually you check if you can set accelerations to zero. Here they aren't equal to zero. Here the modification is that we're going to see if we can set the acceleration of block one equal to the acceleration of block two. And it turns out you can, right? They're attached to the same rope. If one moves down two meters in the course of a second, the other moves up two meters, again, in the positive direction for both of them. So they share the same speed at all times, and therefore they share the same rate of change of speed at all times. So they do have the same acceleration. Again, that's because they're tied together. So we can actually call both these the same number, just A. So I'm going to erase all the subscripts and just relabel them as the variable A. And again, actually, let's do it like this. I'm going to just call them both A, A Y of block 1. And again, all this is saying is that instead of block one and block two having, having different accelerations, they're both equal to each other's. They're both the same number. So once we find this value for A, we know that both the blocks share that acceleration. Okay, perfect. Now let's just count up equations versus unknowns. Let's see, we don't know T. We're given all the M's and we don't know A. So we have two equations, two unknowns. So we are guaranteed set. Now all there is left to do is solve the system of equations. Now if you watched closely in the video, you'll know that during the elimination section I said to be on the lookout for something. And it's that when you have plus t and minus t appearing in two separate equations, you can often instantly solve the problem by adding the two equations together that is you solve the system by elimination. So we're going to do that here. We're going to add up all the stuff on the left sorry I'll do it in the notation I used in the video here I'm going to do a giant plus operation on these guys. Sorry, I should put it up here. Okay, plus t and minus t cancel out, and you're left with, on the left, m2g minus m1g. Okay, equal sign stays in this spot. And on the right here, we have m1a plus m2a. Oh, by the way, I should have mentioned we are assuming that we are given the masses of the blocks, right? We're writing things in terms of M1 and M2. Basically, that's assume you have the M1 and M2s. Get the formula that lets you just plug in M1 equals whatever. So you leave you leave the M1s and treat them as known numbers. Okay. Um, now we have a one variable equation with A, and the only question is, let's get A by itself. Now also in either the systems of equations video, no, it was the scientific notation video, I told you to be on the lookout for when you want to factor a number out. So you yank the A quote-unquote out of parentheses here. You basically extract the common factor of A from both terms. And you get that on the right. And you can actually do the same thing for G on the left if you want. but you don't have to. And now all you have to do is divide both sides by the ugly stuff that's attached to A. Because remember, the whole goal is you want A by itself. 
Okay, those cancel and your result is that, which is the acceleration for an Atwood machine. Okay, now really quickly, I wanna show you guys what happens and the modifications and what saves you if you decide to not do this positive business. What if you call this positive for block two? What changes? Okay, so in that case, let's rewrite the equations. And again, this time we're going to ignore this weird positive clockwise business. We're just going to treat up as positive. So if T minus M1G equals M1A1 and T minus M2G equals M2A2. Again, all I'm doing here is upwards forces minus downwards forces equals whatever object's mass times its acceleration. Okay, now the difference comes in that, well, first of all, this equation, the left-hand side is in the opposite order. The difference comes when you're trying to say, are A1 and A2 the same number, right? Earlier, we, will, we were able to say that they're the same number because if M1 moved in its positive direction, let's say it had an acceleration of positive two, then that means block two would move downwards in its positive direction, also having an acceleration of positive two. In this case, when we're calling block two's positive direction upwards, what's happening if block one has an acceleration of two meters per second squared this way? Well, block two is accelerating pretty fast downwards in the negative direction. So block two's acceleration is actually the negative of block A's, right? If block A, sorry, block one, if block one accelerates upwards at two meters per second in the positive two direction for it, this guy starts accelerating downwards because he's tied to block one, but he's accelerating at negative two meters per second squared, right? His position is getting more in what we call the negative direction. So the difference is that here we say that A2 is not equal to A1, but it's equal to negative A1. So here, instead of writing just A1, we write negative A1. And now you see this equation, by the way, if you, oops, if you multiply this equation by negative one to cancel out the negative signs, then you get back to the same set of equations that we had here. Okay, again, the whole reason we did this weird positive business is so that A2 and A1 were both positive at the same time. If M1 moved upwards, slash accelerated upwards, then M2 would move downwards. So we called downwards positive so that they both had positive accelerations together. Here, the opposite has happened. We chose I don't want to do that garbage. I'm going to call upwards positive for both. The only thing we had to be careful of is, is A2 equal to A1? Well, not quite. When A1 is a positive number, A2, because the block moves down, is a negative of that number. But either way, we got the same equation, so we'll get the same acceleration for block one and the whole system out. Okay? It's a little bit of a fine concept. You're going to deal with it in problems such as when there's pulleys and blocks hanging over them on ropes, it'll be good to call this whole direction positive, again, for the same reason that this block's acceleration that way will equal that block's acceleration that way. But the same thing applies where if you're careful with your minus signs in identifying are the accelerations really the same or are they flipped signs of each other, you will be okay. Okay, one more example, and it's the last major generalization, and it's the fearsome block on a ramp.
Okay. The question might be theta equals 30 degrees. You have a two kilogram block. Find acceleration down the ramp. Now again, these examples up here before the Atwood machine, they were more or less in line with the standard procedure. The Atwood machine introduced this weird concept. The ramp is going to introduce the last truly weird concept. And this concept is that when we break up forces, so first let's draw the forces on this block. Okay, it feels a, if you close your eyes, you feel a push on your butt from the ramp, but it doesn't push straight up, it pushes like perpendicular to the ramp. That was an awful drawing, by the way. It pushes perpendicular to the ramp. Okay, do you feel anything else touching you? Mm, nope. All right, so you draw your gravity arrow. And you know what, let's say that there's also friction between the ramp and the block. Okay, so as you slide down the ramp, your pants get ruffled upwards. So the friction force sort of tries to keep you up on the ramp as you're sliding down the ramp. Okay, free body diagram done. The weird step here and again, this is not something you should have known off the bat. This is a new technique that you'll sometimes have to pull out. And it's, we're going to decompose forces, not along left to right. You're going to decompose them along the ramp. The ramp. And perpendicular to the ramp. Okay, again, this is not something you should have known off the bat. This is something you sort of have to be told at first. So these forces are already perpendicular and parallel to the ramp. The weight force is actually not decomposed yet. So we need to decompose this arrow into this arrow plus this arrow. Okay, And this weight arrow on the diagonal is of size mg, the hypotenuse here. Okay, and we need to find what is this side and what is this side. So now we're provided this angle down here and it turns out that if you think about it, the 30 degrees actually appears there rather than in here. And the way you can think about that is if you shrink the ramp to be really shallow, like let's say five degrees, it's this angle in red right here of the triangle that gets really skinny. So that's how you can tell that this angle and this angle are the same because they shrink together as opposed to this angle right here. Okay, so we have this situation. Hypotenuse 30 degrees. Let's find these sides. Okay, remember mg is the hypotenuse. So to get the side next to the angle, you use the cosine formula. So adjacent equals mg times cosine, theta, cosine of 30. And to get the one opposite the angle, you use the sine formula. Okay, so the force pushing you down the ramp from gravity, it isn't of size mg, it's actually of size mg sine 30. Not all of the mg force is going into pushing you down the ramp. Some of it is being like pushed into the ramp. Okay. Now, thankfully, the difficulty is all in that step. If you've made it here, you've survived the ramp. All we have to do now is write out our Newton's laws. I think I called this step three. And here it's gonna be like, you can pick a direction to call positive as usual. 
So it'll be arrows down the ramp minus arrows up the ramp equals m times acceleration parallel to the ramp's surface. Right in the Atwood machine, um, we sort of generalized what if you call a different direction positive. Here, the difference compared to the original process is you're going to instead of doing arrows right minus arrows left, you're going to do arrows parallel down the ramp minus the arrows pointing up the ramp along its surface. So let's do that. So I'll call this first one along the ramp rather than perpendicular. Okay, what arrows point down the ramp? Let's see. Ah, this one right here, mg sine 30. Minus arrows that point in the opposite direction, uh, we have this friction arrow here. And that equals mass times the acceleration along the ramp. Perfect. All right, what about things perpendicular to the ramp? Let's call things that point that way positive. Okay, so we have in the positive direction arrows, we have Fn, the normal force, minus what's pointing into the ramp here, that's that part of the mg triangle that we had broken up, that's mg cosine 30. And that will equal to m times the perpendicular acceleration, so the acceleration either into the ramp or floating off the surface. And also if we want to we can replace ff with mu Fn, assuming that the ramp works as hard as it can. By the way, I'm going to set mu equals to 0.1 here just to make sure we don't run into trouble with friction being too strong. Okay, so step four is going to be see if we can set any of these to zero, usually the accelerations. So the block starts sliding down the ramp, so the acceleration along the ramp here, that's not zero. But what is zero is this acceleration in this direction, the perpendicular direction. right? If it wasn't zero, the block would be starting to float perpendicularly off the ramp or to float into the surface of the ramp. So this stuff is safely set to zero. Okay, perfect. Step five is going to be to count our equations and unknowns. So we have two equations. How many unknowns do we have? Let's see, we're given mass, we're given, or g is just 9.8. All right, we don't know normal force. That appears here too. And we don't know a perpendicular, but we're safe, right? We have two equations, two unknowns. So we are guaranteed safe, awesome. Now all there is left to do is solve the system and then we'll be through ramps with friction, which I consider to be one of the most difficult uh, free body diagram problems to be given. All right, let's solve this baby. Bottom equation looks pretty easy because the upper equation has two variables in it at once, looks pretty ugly. I should be able to get the um, what Fn is really easily. Okay, I just move this to the other side. Okay, uh, I'm gonna plug in numbers for m, g, and theta. All right, two. Okay, I'm just gonna plug this in my calculator. Sixteen point nine seven newtons of normal force. Perfect. Now all we have to do is plug that number in here, and our upper equation will be really simple. Okay, m is uh, now. I'm just going to rewrite the upper equation with this value substituted in. Okay, m is two, g is nine point eight minus. Let's see, mu was told to us to be point one. Normal force was 16.97, and it equals the mass of the object, which is again 2 times A. 
Perfect, we have a giant load of numbers, but only one variable. So let's just plug this side into our calculator. minus 0 0.1 times 16.97. This side is equal to 8.103. Divide both sides by 2. And this gives us that A equals 4.05 meters per second squared. And for free along the way we found the unknown normal for us. This is a result, guys. Even if you aren't 100% sure, by the way, don't be discouraged if you wouldn't have thought of this by yourself. You're absolutely not supposed to be able to come up with this new generalization by yourself. If you think that you might be able to recreate this, if you have some semblance of how we got here, excellent work, because this is a truly difficult problem. In fact, so difficult that I'm going to go back in the video and edit in a little cutscene saying, take a break before this last one because it's going to be tough. Alright, once again guys, this has been Free Body Diagrams and Newton's Second Law. Really, really difficult to learn. If you made it here and you're still feeling discouraged, don't worry. With practice and with just the right word of choice, maybe by a classmate or a professor, you will lock it in, I promise you. I had a lot of trouble learning this myself. It was the hardest part of physics to learn, and it's the hardest part to teach. So keep on it, and I promise you, it will get a lot better. And once you're past this, know that there's mostly easy stuff ahead. Conservation of energy um, tends to be a fan favorite, and Torx will use this, but it'll be a lot easier. So excellent work, guys. I'll see you in the next video. Till then.